All right, I'd like to call the meeting of the ISFMP Policy Board to order. Everyone should have their meeting materials as well as their agenda and their our proceedings from our August 2014 meeting. If you would give me the license to move some things around on the agenda to accommodate travel schedules and plans, I would appreciate it. Um, and I am adding two items on to the general, uh, an issue from Mark Gibson on the Winter Flounder Board and then an update from Tony on the herring section. So without objection or correction, Everybody comfortable with the minutes and the agenda? By consensus approved. So the first item of business is Mark Gibson. With a motion from the Winter Flounder Board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I have just transitioned from dogfish to winter flounder. <laughs> um, we have a um, committee motion from the Winter Flounder uh, Board that uh, I know that was yesterday or the day before. Anyways, uh, the motion relates to um, um, inconsistencies, difficulties that we're having with uh, ASMFC and federal management of winter flounder. So the board passed this motion, and I'll read it for you. On behalf of the Winter Flounder Board, moves the commission send a letter to the New England Fishery Management Council and NOAA Fisheries urging a reduction in the southern New England mid-Atlantic winter flounder possession limit to bycatch limits only for federal vessels based on sea sampling data for trips targeting other, targeting other species. Motion by Mr. Gibbs. <clears throat> That's committee motion, so I don't think we need a second to that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, again, this motion um, derives from some uh, lack of comfort that the board has with federal management of winter flounder uh, as opposed to commission uh, management, commission's management of the Southern New England stock. It's very restrictive uh, for the benefit of the board, members that are on the board, is a 50 pound commercial possession limit, a uh, limited season, and uh, bag limits for recreational uh, fisheries. Uh, in contrast, um, for starting for fishing year, ground fish fishing year 2013, um, the England Council reallocated winter flounder. It had been closed, a possession uh, ban for four years prior to that, uh, but they reallocated it uh, so that the sectors have uh, a winter flounder ace in their portfolios and uh, the general category or common pool fishery uh, has a, uh, a sub-ACL which is administered by the regional administrators through possession limits. And in some cases, those possession limits have been very high, 5,000 pounds, uh, I think, the beginning of the first year, again, contrasted with a 50-pound uh, state possession limit. Uh, so there's been a lot of angst at the Winter Flounder Board, and uh, this is a motion that uh, came out of the board. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest that the uh, policy board that they they take a close look at that at this. Um, it's very prescriptive. Uh, they're asking for something uh, very specific in terms of making major changes to how the New England Council uh, has proceeded with winter flounder management. Uh, there are some uh, New England Council members here. I don't. Looks like the chair may have have left. Uh, but I'm not sure that this is doable uh, for the council, uh, at least in, not in the short term. We have uh, framework uh, 53 is going to be voted on uh, in November at the November council meeting. Um, that does not contemplate changes to the winter flounder management program. There's always an a already an ABC set with a state waters uh, assumption. Um, so I think this would Council might, uh, this board might want to consider a, uh, a softer letter or a different tone that um, perhaps asks for consultation and closer cooperation with the commission, uh, perhaps uh, uh, reminding them that we have different levels of cooperation. We have a, for example, you know, this winter flounder plan where we have um, sort of a tag along for lack of a better word, but in Atlantic Herring we have much closer coordination and then there's something like Summer Flounder we're embedded right into a joint plan uh, with the Mid-Atlantic Council. So there are different levels of cooperation and coordination that the Commission has and there may be a better model for Winter Flounder. Um, there's some thinking that the letter might, might be better served to express those kind of uh, concepts and opening a dialogue on that as opposed to a very prescriptive action uh, that the New England Council is probably powerful List, even if they wanted to do so to address in the short term. So that's my um, comments to the board uh, on this motion. Okay. 
Dave? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and as I recall, it was my, uh, my motion, of it, but I um, appreciate all Mark's comments about the practical limitations of some of the things we're asking for, and, I, and uh, certainly um, Bob and Tony and, and the rest of the staff have heard, um, heard the deep concern the Winter Flounder Board has, and I think a letter that simply conveyed that, uh, the tone of this, and perhaps um, um, preserve that, but um, perhaps back go off a little, as Mark said, in terms of the spe uh, specificity, I would certainly be comfortable with that, but I, I do think we want to urge New England to really engage and try to get that fishing mortality back down on winter flounder um, as a, uh, given the, the troubled stock status it has, the challenges with environmental change uh, and, um, and the inability um, for this species to rebound in the face of the 1,600 ton um, um, ACL that's set on it now. So. David. Uh, yes, uh, I support the motion. I'm a New England Council member. There's been a great deal of discussion about winter flounder across the board, Gulf of Maine winter flounder, of course. That's going to be focused on George's Bank and Gulf of Maine winter flounder focused on at our upcoming uh, November Council meeting. We're going to get some information from the SSC regarding specifications for that stock. So there'll be a lot of discussion about winter flounder. In southern New England, mid-Atlantic winter flounder discussion, I'm assuming will still continue. So this particular um, request um, is very timely. It also is timely in that the New England Council appears at this point in time to actually be considering for May 1, 2015, having Gulf of Maine cod as a bycatch fishery only. So it'll stimulate more discussion. Certainly this motion will stimulate more discussion about the merits of the benefits from you know, the pros and the cons of having um, this sort of a restriction applying to winter, winter flounder as well as Gulf of Maine cod. Anything else on the motion? Any further questions? Seeing none, is there any objection to this motion? Wait. So if this motion approves, we'll have Mark and David work with um, Bob to craft the letter in the way that you deem it most appropriate. Is that fair? Okay. So, everybody's comfortable with that? So is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Fish Passage Working Group met, it was back in February, and uh, Steve Gephardt is going to give us a report on the Fish Passage Working Group. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the first, the Fish Passage Working Group did meet on February 11th and 12th of this year, and most of us promptly got stranded in Raleigh while it experienced its worst snowstorm in memory. The objective of the meeting was to make progress on four of the eight tasks assigned to the group. The first, task two, is to prioritize fish passage projects on a coast-wide basis. And, and developing a prioritization system has been a long-standing yet elusive uh, objective. In light of recent developments, the working group considered two protocol options for developing um, an inventory of barriers. One is a state-specific approach using existing prioritization approaches um, or the use of regional aquatic conductivity tools that are being developed to prioritize barriers. Several states have 
begun to uh, prioritize their projects within their states using expert knowledge. But alternatively, the Nature Conservancy, working with many partners, has developed a habitat-driven approach that ranked about 13,000 dams in the northeastern states. Um, these rankings reflected the benefit derived to anadromous species uh, if the dam was made passable, either through fish passage or removal. It mostly reflected the amount of habitat that would be reconnected. This Northeast Aquatic Connectivity Project was completed in 2011, and a similar project was completed by TNC soon thereafter for the Chesapeake Bay Area. A Southeast Aquatic Connectivity Project is scheduled for completion in December of this year. The working group received a report from TNC on this last project. Slight differences were noted between these three regional barrier databases used in the projects, and consequently, slightly different metrics were used for prioritizing barriers. But consultation after the meeting suggested that differences would have minimal effects on the prioritization. So the completion of this Southeast project would allow us to use a coast-wide tool to rank potential passage sites into priorities. So therefore, the working group decided that the regional connectivity uh, tools provided the more standardized approach to prioritizing fish passage projects and finalized the protocol uh, for guidance in developing a coast-wide inventory. Regional connectivity tools provide data-based repeatable methods. So following the completion of the Southeast Project, the group members will develop a prioritized list that will be compiled into a coast-wide priority inventory. The inventory will allow comparison of passage projects across states and serve to support, uh, serve as support for regional or coast-wide funding opportunities. So um, we're making progress on that task. A little more work needs to be done. Uh, the next task, task four, recommends, is to recommend targets for increasing fish passage in each state. So, uh, our goal here is to provide guidance and challenges to agencies to restore more diadromous fish runs of managed species to their state. There is much discussion on what types of targets to use. The two main approaches considered were one species, so an example of that would be, um, let's say, this, each state needs to add 200,000 American shad to their waters over some given time. The second approach is habitat, and an example of this would be each state would open up 200 miles of habitat in their state um, for the specified species. The working group agreed on the habitat approach. It was reasoned that individual watershed plans, many of which are already developed, could help develop these targets. The group agreed that the current fish passage monitoring abilities are not adequate for tracking progress toward targets. The group discussed that resources uh, providing fish passage very considerably among states, and therefore state-specific targets should be developed. Each representative on the group was asked to consider what target challenges and time frames would be reasonable for their states for future discussions. Task six, develop guidance for navigating the FERC dam relicensing project. Of course, this is hydroelectricity uh, relicensing. While most states engage in this process, it's often the inland fish divisions and often the marine fisheries divisions that are represented here in ASMFC and are managing diadromous fish species have not been engaged. The purpose of this task is to encourage involvement by ASMFC parties, but the FERC process is not easily understood for the uninitiated. So a subcommittee of the Fish Passage Working Group is developing a user's guide to help state staff understand how and when to intervene on behalf of the agency, working to protect and restore managed diadromous species. 
subcommittee members from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA uh, have taken the lead on developing this document, and this will be and we'll be providing a draft um, to members and FERC staff for their review. Um, the people who are working on this are people who have um, a quite a bit of experience in the FERC process, and so their uh, involvement in this has been just um, uh, critical to developing this document. So we're waiting on one more section to be contributed from a member, and then this draft will be compiled and sent out for review. Um, I can't say exactly when this would be a final would be available, but we're working toward that goal. Finally, the last task is task five, initiate an East Coast Passage Plan. And uh, we are deliberately kicking this can down the road. This task really must wait until task two and four are completed. We want to be able to prioritize the um, fish passage uh, projects on a coastwide basis, and we want to be able to um, uh, have some recommendation for targets within the states. But there's one more um, report to discuss that, that um, indirectly is going to support uh, this task. Dr. Alex Harrow of the U.S. Geological Survey at the Conte Lab in Massachusetts is um, working on uh, establishing an East Coast fishway database um, and, and is working with our group on this. The group discussed the merits of this database for improving regional conductivity tools and contributing to the development of an East Coast Passage Plan. These regional conductivity tools that I talked about earlier, the, that Nature Conservancy and others have been working on, they don't include comprehensive fishway data. So we can list the dams, but we don't necessarily know which of those dams currently have fish passage at them. So um, the group decided that um, including dam removals in the database would also be a beneficial addition for tracking conductivity. So not only tell us um, where the fishways are, but where the dams used to be and have been removed. The database was re redeveloped as an Excel format as opposed to an access format to increase participation, and instructions were developed for updating the database. The Fish Passage Working Group is currently wrapping up edits and refinements to this database before going online for data population this winter. And um, I know that um, Jeff Kipp has recently, very recently, had a discussion with Alex on this, and, and we're hoping to get this um, um, this database up on an FTP site soon so that all of the states can start populating um, it with data from their individual states. This will be an ongoing project, but the uh, working group will continue to work on with um, the various project uh, uh, principal investigators after initial data collection this winter to link the data, the fish passage database with a barrier database for prioritizations, um, which will give us a much more complete picture. So that's my presentation. Thank you, Steve. Questions for Steve? Leroy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just curious. Um, <coughs> In the work that you guys have been doing, are you taking into consideration expansion of uh, populations of invasive species? That's something we've been wrestling with a little bit in, in Pennsylvania of late. <laughs> I understand your question. <laughs> um, no, the answer is we are not, and I, I understand the concerns. I mean, with invasive species coming up, I, I know people are thinking, if we start removing dams, is this just going to spread um, you know, species out? You know, we're sort of working at cross purposes. Obviously, we want to uh, increase conductivity for um, native species, but uh, we don't want to spread these invasives. Um, our working group has not grappled with this thorny issue, and I think every state is going to have to do that. Um, but right now, we're just focusing on, on really, especially with the prioritization, that may, um, that may be an extra parameter that people are going to have to consider 
consider, but so much of this prioritization work is being done for funding purposes, and therefore, if, if a state or it, it, its regional partners don't want to connect the habitat because of uh, catfish issues, they wouldn't be looking for funding, so they would sort of withdraw that from the list. But for right now, we think um, the best use of these databases is to be inclusive, have everything in there, uh, so at least we know what's there. Anything else for Steve? Seeing none, thank you very much for your report. Appreciate it. <laughs> Melissa, are you ready? And then Lisa, you'll be next. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I will be providing an update on the Habitat Committee today. So um, the Habitat Committee held its second in-person meeting earlier this week. Um, so to start off the meeting, we had a uh, series of presenters, uh, three speakers, two from universities and one from the Environmental Protection Agency um, to share their research and habitat related issues. And the purpose was to bring in outside expertise and perspectives that can enhance the work of Habitat Committee members. Uh, we followed with a discussion of ocean acidification task forces and then reviewed the 2014 and 2015 work plans. So um, the first speaker oh, next slide. Uh, we had was uh, Troy Hartley from the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. He's a research associate professor and he did a study on fisheries and land use um, discourse. Uh, this was a two-part study. Uh, commission staff had uh, advised Mr. Hartley and his research associates earlier this year on the fisheries aspect of the study. So first he conducted a network uh, ana communications analysis among land use planners. And the second part of the study he conducted a discourse analysis to compare the language between uh, fishery management plans and uh, land use, uh, comprehensive land use plans. And so what he found was that, um, this is a very abbreviated uh, summary of his presentation, was that fisheries and land use managers are not communicating often enough, so they're not building the trust as necessary uh, when they're trying to implement uh, things such as fish passage uh, on people's properties. Um, and second was that they are not using similar words. There's uh, uh, complex uh, jargon that's associated with each of the disciplines, and so there's not that understanding developed between um, land use managers and fisheries managers. And so some of the takeaway measures that he provided to the Habitat Committee was that um, it would be helpful to recognize individuals uh, that serve critical roles in making these networks function. Regular communication between regional fisheries and science and management and local land use planning communities would allow for more effective um, implementation of uh, these restoration projects. And also to understand the layers of professional networks at the local level. So again, uh, frequency of communication will lead to mutual understanding, uh, trust, interests, and concerns. So the second presenter we had was Phil Calaruso from the EPA. Uh, he provided a talk on blue carbon, which uh, even some of the Habitat Committee members had not heard of. And so what blue carbon is, is it's carbon associated with salt marshes, seagrass, and mangroves. So um, uh, on the conference side, the green carbon is what is associated with you know, trees and their ability to absorb uh, carbon dioxide. So uh, blue carbon is what's in the ocean. And, so uh, blue carbon is actually more effective than tropical forests at absorbing uh, carbon dioxide from emissions. So uh, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation formed uh, a working group which consists of NOAA, EPA, the USGS, NASA, and even government officials from Canada and Mexico. Um, and they have uh, over a million dollars in funding to estimate blue carbon in North America or the potential of uh, these habitats to absorb carbon dioxide. 
So the policy implications for, carb for blue carbon is um, development of the carbon trading markets. Uh, this would create more incentive and potentially provide more money for large-scale restoration of these habitats. And naturally, this would lead to economic valuation of seagrass, salt marsh, and mangrove habitats. Also, Blue Carbon uh, is a potential bridge between Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. So the last presenter we had was uh, Peter Oster from the University of Connecticut. Uh, he um, shared his research on habitats, populations, and ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the points he made, but he wanted to uh, press that fisheries um, science and habitat managers need to connect the dots in order to make more realistic, in order to more realistically parameterize uh, spatially explicit single species, multi-species, and ecosystem models inclusive of habitat mediated processes, and then use this information to advise managers. So specifically, uh, stock assessment should, uh, whenever possible, include considerations for habitat. So um, the next topic we discussed was the Ocean Acidification Task Force. So states such as Maine and Maryland have created task forces to study the effects of and potential risks of ocean acidification in their state waters. So um, since we didn't have a Maine representative, the um, representative for Maryland provided uh, experiences and some of the results from the task force so far. Then we moved on to the uh, 2014 work plan. Um, we are currently developing the Habitat Hotline Atlantic 2014 issue, uh, which focuses on climate change impacts of fish habitats. And also, um, this includes um, updates on activities by state and federal agency agencies to address climate change. And we are uh, hoping to publish this by the end of this year. Uh, for the habitat management series, we are working on a nearshore and estuarine aquaculture and fish habitats publication. Um, and this would hopefully be a useful reference for managers and also people that are interested in aquaculture. Uh, we are continuing on working, uh, developing the cyanide habitat source document. This would be similar to the diadromous uh, fish habitats document that we produced in 2009. And we had hired, um, the commission had hired a contractor um, to do a lot of the, sign, the literature review for this, so this is just moving along. And we also are working on a living shorelines erosion controls um, document, actually an, a, an update of the 2010 edition that we produced. So um, after events such as uh, Hurricane Sandy, there's more and more interest in living shorelines as a strategy for erosion control. Um, this is a, a natural way of um, mitigating these climate change effects rather than like bulkheads and things like that that could, um, are not as natural and this would offer um, more opportunities for fish habitats to be developed. So then moving on to the 2015 work plan, some of these things will be carrying over uh, to our activities next year. Uh, we will also be continuing on the Habitat Bottlenecks Write Paper, and this is to address um, uh, species that may not be um, rebuilding um, in response to uh, management, but perhaps there's a habitat component that is limiting the ability of these species to rebuild. So we are um, providing some more case studies to this Habitat Bottlenecks White Paper, and hopefully uh, it will be used to um, increase uh, considerations in stock assessments as well for certain species. And following the land use discourse presentation, the Habitat Committee is interested in developing a toolbox. Uh, so we will pull together references that we can share with land use planners to uh, hopefully increase communication and understanding of like what fisheries managers need um, in terms of uh, things like fish passage and other restoration projects. So uh, that concludes my discussion. Oh wait, actually, one more thing. Um, the committee membership. Uh, so the com Habitat Committee is interested in uh, filling in some of the vacant and inactive seats. Uh, for example, we're, we currently don't have a main representative and we feel that it would be a valuable addition to the committee. Uh, we are also looking to recruit a new Army Corps of Engineers representative. So that concludes my uh, rep presentation, thank you. Okay, Melissa, questions for Melissa? Dr. Pierce? 
Yeah, Melissa, you described the action plan for 2015. Did that action plan have anything in it regarding what the committee would do regarding continued discussions on the concept you highlighted, which is uh, blue carbon? Uh, I hadn't heard that term before, blue carbon trading. Kind of interesting. Uh, it sounds to me like industry could pump more CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, provided it would somehow promote proliferation of seagrass and mangrove uh, mangrove swamps to take the take the carbon dioxide out of the water. So it's kind of a is, is the committee going to address that concept in any way? Um, so this was actually the first time the topic came up um, to the Habitat Committee, so we have not thought of any activities uh, to address this issue. But if you have suggestions, um, we would be happy to listen. Anything else from Melissa? Lauren. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for that report. I'm especially interested in the living shoreline uh, uh, initiatives that you discussed, uh, erosion control st uh, strategies, uh, and in particular, uh, how that might have an interface with our uh, educational institutions. Uh, for example, uh, I'm personally familiar with a program uh, called uh, Grasses in Classes that helped uh, kids to actually participate in uh, such uh, activities, hands-on activities. Uh, has, has there been a, um, an effort to reach out to educational institutions, whether it be elementary or perhaps high school uh, programs, to, to uh, develop such a component to this program? Uh, yes, that was actually something that we discussed um, in addition to uh, this publication was to increase the educational aspect of uh, living shorelines because there uh, is a lot of uh, increasing amount of interest uh, among landowners, uh, but there is still a distrust on like how how the designs would be built and you know what would happen to their properties. So there definitely is interest in uh, creating more outreach tools for this. Not necessarily children, but their parents who own the poverty. Anything else from Melissa? <laughs> if not, thank you, Melissa. You're up, Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For those of you who don't know me, I'm new here. I'm the new ACFIP coordinator taking Emily Green's place. Um, and I'm going to give a brief report on the um, Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership meeting with the steering committee that we had on Monday. First, we had some discussion on science and data initiatives that were going on. Um, we talked about a decision support tool to assess aquatic habitats and threats in the North Atlantic watersheds and estuaries. And we're working on a North Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative funded project, and it's being carried out by Downstream Strategies. And ACFIP is the lead on the coastal component of this project. And we're currently um, in the process of finalizing the winter flounder model that's taking place in Narragansett Bay, and we're working to move on to river herring next as a diadromous fish component. We've been working for the past couple years on the species habitat matrix, and we finally were able to submit the manuscript to science last week, so we're waiting to hear back on reviews for that. And also, we are working on a NIFWF, which is National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funded river herring habitat restoration strategies assessment. And that is working to identify priority threats to five different watersheds on the Atlantic coast. And this will be useful for identifying key on the ground projects in the future for both ACFIP and also NIFWF. Next, we spent a great deal of time talking about our implementation plan, and we evaluated the status of every action item in the implementation plan and identified areas that need attention before the spring meeting. The majority of the tasks have been completed or are underway, so it's, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, and we also talked about the conservation strategic plan as well, which is coming to conclusion in 2016. We also talked about fish habitat partnership updates at the national, coastal, and regional level. As far as the national level is concerned, we received a multi-state conservation grant um, back last month for $50,000 for ACFIP. Um, which is great. <laughs> um, we also talked about the 501c status of the National Fish Habitat Partnership, and we have been granted this status, and we are now working on the tax exemption. 
and we are currently working on rebranding and marketing at the National Fish Habitat Partnership level as well. And all this will be discussed further on Sunday at our National Fish Habitat Partnership workshop in uh, Washington, D.C. At the coastal level, we will be presenting at Restore America's Estuaries meeting next week um, in Washington, D.C., and we're working on collaborations for both the panel discussion and giving presentations. And then in the regional level, we um, talked about our whitewater to blue water initiative, and we're working on moving our focus to more on-the-ground projects and away from outreach, but we're currently working on a fish passage barrier brochure template um, that can be ma modified by various nonprofits uh, non and conservation groups to reach target audiences. So that's our current project for Whitewater to Blue Water. We also accepted a new member into the partnership. The International Federation of Fly Fishers came up here and gave a presentation on their organization. They're uh, um, an international organization of 13,000 members and that they approached us to join the partnership, so we were very excited to have them on board. This is our first conservation group to join, and also we think it's a great addition because they have a lot of non-traditional backgrounds, so most of them are not scientists, which will add a nice perspective to the partnership. And last, we discussed our um, the applications for proposals from um, from various groups. We requested project applications back in August on the 20th, and this was to restore and conserve habitats necessary to support coastal, estuarine-dependent, and diadromous fish species. And we were asking for on-the-ground habitat conservation and improvement projects with a maximum amount available for requesting of $50,000. The deadline was October 3rd. After that, we, re uh, we received three proposals and um, a subcommittee on ACFIP was, got together and ranked the proposals and we discussed this with this, the entire steering committee on Monday. The steering committee decided to recommend two projects for funding. One was a dam removal project in, Massa in Massachusetts and the second one was a fishway installation project in Maine. Um, so we'll be contacting U.S. Fish and Wildlife to recommend those projects. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Any questions for Lisa? Dr. Pierce. Yeah, just, just a quick one, Lisa. You said in your presentation that something was submitted to the Journal Science for publication. But what, what was that? That's right. It was the species habitat matrix that ACFIP has been working on over the past couple of years. Um, we, once it gets accepted into a journal, we'll be able to post more about it online, but there is a, a review of the matrix, and it talks about um, all of the, the different priority habitats along the Atlantic coast broken down into four different subregions, and it prioritized habitats um, through the life cycle for the fish that we're most interested in. I haven't got anything in science. Do you? It's pretty cool. Well, welcome, Lisa, and thank you for your report. Mark. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Law Enforcement Committee had a very busy and productive meeting uh, this, this time around. Uh, we had standing room only for a good part of the day, and we had a lot of um, outside uh, participants from different enforcement jurisdictions uh, come and, and visit with us throughout the day. Uh, I've submitted a uh, written summary of the meeting for the for the uh, ASMFC Policy Board. I'll just get a, go through a couple of quick highlights. Uh, we did talk about a number of different species issues that uh, uh, ASMFC is dealing with. Uh, we did hear a uh, presentation from enforcement folks in, in Maine uh, regarding uh, something they're exploring uh, dealing with the possible uh, transferability of, of lobster trap tags from trap to trap. This is not something that's being actively considered by the by the commission at this time, but it is something they're interested in and they want to get some early input from the law enforcement committee. So we heard that presentation. Uh, we discussed a number of possible enforcement issues that might be a concern there uh, as, a as, as, a, as a response to that. But um, the folks in Maine are going to give us more specific language and, and some, some details in writing that we can take a look at as a, as a body and uh, consider whether it's necessary at some point down the road to, to comment on that proposal. Um, we also address, as, as you probably know, we have within the ASMFC action plan, um, 
we have a number of, of tasks that are specifically assigned, if you will, to, the law, to your law enforcement committee. And we try to make sure that we cover those uh, every year. So one of those for the current uh, 2014 action plan that we really need to, needed to get working on uh, was a review and possible update of the enforcement guidelines that we've referenced every now and then in commenting to you. Uh, these original guidelines were, <clears throat> were completed in 2009, so it's a five-year review process. And we had a, a good bit of discussion during our meeting going through the document, looking at specific edits and changes and updates that we want to make. And we've also uh, incorporated some of the, uh, some of the formatting and, and the approach that's been taken in a similar document that was prepared by NOAA and the uh, U.S. Coast Guard for federal, federal, federal use. So we're hoping to combine the, the best features of those two documents and we want to uh, have that done before the end of the year. Uh, it's our commitment. And uh, once we do that, we'll certainly be presenting it to the ASMFC Policy Board and uh, in some early discussions with, with, with Bob. And, and hopefully uh, uh, we can do this. The LEC members express real interest in bringing that uh, new document to you in a kind of a more formal way and maybe even having an opportunity to sit down with a few of the members from the LEC, go through it, explain some of these basic law enforcement precepts that we really want to keep hammering at. And, uh, and, and familiarize you with this uh, enforceab enforceability guidelines document that we're, that we're working on. Um, <clears throat> in other issues, we, we also heard a presentation um, uh, concerning uh, possible enforcement issues uh, with American Lobster, particularly in federal waters, offshore waters, where, uh, where enforcement challenges in increase significantly. Uh, and we discussed uh, some, of the, some of the problems of, of limited capability in terms of offshore vessels and gear for hauling traps and inspecting traps to make sure that they're uh, being properly deployed and used. Um, we talked a little bit about some ways to start thinking of, of getting additional funding or resources to, uh, to enhance our enforcement efforts, uh, particularly in Area 3 for the lobster management areas. Um, we had a similar conversation earlier in the day, or later in the day, regarding uh, VMS, which happened to be a, a discussion that was also part of our action plan commitment. And it, as it turns out, of course, this, relate, this issue of, of offshore enforcement in, in the uh, American Lobster Management Area 3 uh, is, is an area where possibly uh, use of VMS uh, for that fleet would, would be helpful. Um, so there's some things that tied in there. Um, and then at the end of the day, we had a very personal uh, send off for our, our friend and colleague, Joe Fessenden. Uh, as you all know, this was his, his last meeting. And uh, so as, uh, as a member of the law enforcement committee, we kind of gave him a special send off and it was uh, a very fitting tribute. And, and of course, he'll be greatly missed. But we also welcome Maine has a new representative uh, to the LEC, uh, John Cornish, so hopefully we won't miss any strides. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mark. Questions for Mark on the law enforcement report? Seeing none. Nicely done. Thank you, sir. Shree, for the Management and Science Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Management and Science Committee met to discuss a number of issues and had presentations on various topics. The committee heard updates from ASMFC staff regarding progress on stock assessments currently underway, saw presentations from the Science Center for Marine Fisheries regarding collaborative industry, agency, and academic research, the NIMS climate change stock vulnerability analysis, the NOAA Fisheries Fish Smart program, including the latest in barrel trauma reduction tools, and the research set aside program and plans to improve the Mid Atlantic research set aside in the future. The committee heard updates on the ASMFC and Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council Observer Program and deliberated over future plans for the program. 
and then uh, re revisited the role of the committee in stock assessment peer review planning, and finally, the MSC was updated on the current status of the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership, the cooperative winter tagging crews, CMAP, NEMAP, and coastwide aging activities. One of the tasks that the MSC addressed was to provide input to this policy board in proposing changes to the technical committee guidelines on consensus and voting on recommendations or decisions coming from the technical committees. The MSC has prepared a number of recommendations and explanations for these recommendations. However, the MSC would like to recommend having uh, more time and having members of the MSC and the Assessment Science Committee work together to draft some language that would change the meeting policies and procedures for TCs that would remove the language about voting entirely add an option for TCs to prepare minority reports if a unanimous decision cannot be made, allow ASMFC staff to participate in the decision-making process, and define the, the term consensus as currently it is a bit nebulous in meaning either unanimous or a majority. Through the MSC discussion, it was felt that a unanimous recommendation was not achieved, I'm sorry, if a unanimous recommendation is not achieved, then allowing a minority report would provide unbiased technical advice without bringing politics to the TC table. An example would be TC members may feel pressure to support their agency or state position and may feel conflicted if science supports an opposite position without first consulting with their agency or state. Voting may lead to uninformed scientific products. Examples may be TC members have less expertise on certain issues, may feel pressured to vote without being fully informed or they may be um, no, where they may normally refrain from voting, or TC members may simply abstain from voting entirely, decreasing overall participation in the actual process. Voting does not give the reasoning behind a TC that cannot come up with consensus. Typically when the TC or stock assessment scientists cannot come to a consensus, they need more time to further explore all options. Multiple management and science committee members that have been on technical committees in the past expressed that they did vote in the past. At times it was very contentious. Uh, rules of order were really not understood and it became un came a little wild, and they felt that they were doing a disservice to the board. The consensus initiative came out of a past voting, came out of past voting for raise on the TCs. Um, voting may break the, the level of trust between CC members, which is important so that members feel important to express ideas openly during discussions. And while ASMFC staff currently are not TC members, they conduct much of the TC's technical work and has a thorough understanding of the scientific issues. Without a change to the policy, they will need to remain mute during some of these important decisions and discussions of which they may add a lot of clarity to, to some of this confusion. So the MSC is asking of the policy board that you provide us with a little bit more time to continue to discuss this and come back with a more thorough uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Just, and just for clarification, if you'll recall, um, we'd run into some issues where we weren't getting technical committee advice because they couldn't come to a consensus on the science. And as a result, we 
requested that they go back to um, voting on issues that come in front of the Management Science Committee, I mean the Technical Committees. And so when a decision couldn't be, when a consensus couldn't be reached. And so this is the response um, from the Management and Science Committee on our, on our direction um, to, the, to the technical committees to provide a vote. So it's not that we necessarily asked for their opinion. I'm glad they felt comfortable enough to provide us with their opinion. Um, and you know there are options. May, there, we, there may be options that we want to consider, similar to what the Management and Science Committee has has presented here today. Um, the one thing I would say, <clears throat> and I guess to some degree speaking unilaterally, is I would be very concerned about ha ha having our staff be put in a position to to vote on any issues within the at the technical committee level. I think that could create a tremendous amount of trouble for our staff um, and conflicts there. So just as background to the issue, um, that's why this, this issue is on the table. So with that, if there are any questions for Cherie on any of her report, um, be happy to call the Brandon. So just for clarification then, depending on the answer, maybe I have a comment. Has the TC guidance document, be, has, has it been changed to indicate they will vote? Or are, we, or are we discussing whether or not we should change the TC guidance document to ask them to vote? Brandon, the policy board made that, the, you all voted to change the procedures, so currently, yes, you are, you have told the TCs to vote. I have language to present to you today as a reflection of that vote, that vote at the last August policy board meeting um, for you all to review and accept for the guidance document itself. but. From August to now, if a TC has met and had to make a recommendation or a decision to bring back to the board, we have given them the instructions that if they cannot reach consensus, then they would need to vote on the issue. For everything that has come back to us for this um, meeting, there has no votes had been needed to be taken. Um, so the next presentation is that language change. Um, that staff put together prior to the MSC putting together their report. Doug. Oh, I appreciate the technical committee uh, providing their, their input on this because uh, from someone who was um, at one point part of the TCs that did vote, um, it, it appears that the culture has changed because um, there were many of us that when the board implemented this were very concerned about not being able to vote because the now the new standard was consensus and sometimes instead of um, to try and help move the technical committee forward in the task that they ha had uh, um, uh, been charged with we had to um, possibly give in to some of the things that we've felt fairly strongly about from a technical standpoint. In other words, you know, oftentimes, as with any scientific discourse, there's differences of opinion that may be, both may be very well founded. But at that time, I remember a lot of uh, us on the technical committee were very concerned that we could not sit there and say, this is what we believe, and we're gonna vote on it in this way, and clearly if we lost the vote, there was a minority report that was that you could request, uh, but the majority opinion would also be put forward, but at least you could, you could stand by what you believed in as a scientist. Now clearly also in our, our uh, guidance document, there is clear instructions to the technical committee that you should not be representing your state policy, but to give your best technical input, uh, unbiased technical input on this. 
And at least at that time when we had that guidance, some of us felt that um, we had to uh, stray from our, what our opinions were to try and move the process forward. Um, I, I noticed we're going to be discussing this, and I think ultimately I still agree that the number one priority should be consensus. Absolutely. We want to try and develop a consensus, but if there isn't, um, the desire was to have a vote because we didn't want to have a minority and majority opinion if the minority opinion was one person on a, on a say, a 12 or 13 person board. I could understand where a minority majority opinion when you had a, say, a, a seven to six um, difference of opinion where we really want to have that that uh, that difference but it, it's interesting to hear how obviously we have a new uh, 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 crop of technical committee people that have grown up on a consensus and now they're concerned about voting because they're afraid that it may they may be forced to uh, because their vote is going to be known to not be able to give what their true opinion is. Well, with that lead down, I think we can go to Tony and let her move on to the next, unless there's more for Sheree on other I I items of the MSC report. Seeing none, thank you, Sheree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I think the lead-in has been taken care of. Um, so I'm just going to go through the language that we changed in the technical committee and stock assessment guidance document to reflect the board motion last August. Um, and Doug, just to reassure you, that guidance is still in the document about representing the best scientific information and not the political. And it's in bold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> so um, there's two things that we addressed. First, is committee tasking. Um, the policy board gave specific guidance on committee tasking that the board chair will communicate all committee tasks to the groups. Um, the new language is on page seven of the document. It's on, it was on the CD. It's highlighted in yellow, but species specific, uh, specific technical tasks should be directed to the appropriate ISFMP technical support group in, in writing by the board section or chair. This can be communicated via the ISFMP staff. Board and sections will develop specific and clear guidance in writing whenever tasking committees for advice. And the board or section will develop that charge. And any charge developed by a board or section to a technical committee would be initially forwarded by the chair or ISFMP staff to the TC for their review and input. So that is the first um, set of guidance. Are there any questions on that language? Okay, that's a pretty simple one. And we were already basically doing that. We just had to tweak the language a little bit. Um, for committee deliberation, um, policy board changed the TC deliberation procedures. The previous method was a consensus-based decision, and the new guidance was to uh, reach consensus um, if you can, but when you cannot, then uh, the decision should be made via vote. Um, this is on page both 11 and 19 of the document. 11 has a little bit more detail, 19 is a, a pared down. The committee chair is also responsible for clarifying the majority and or minority opinions where possible. The overall, uh, is that right? The, overall goal of the technical support groups is to develop recommendations through consensus. The chair is responsible for facilitating committee discussion towards reaching a consensus recommendation for board or section consideration. If a consensus cannot be reached, the committee shall vote on the issue. The minority opinion shall be presented to the board or section as the recommendation defined as sim a simple majority, including to be presented to the board or section as the recommendation 
legislation defined as simple majority, including in a record number of votes in favor and against. The committee will also present the minority opinion prepared by a committee member that voted in the minority to the border section. Voting should only be used as a last resort when full consensus cannot be reached. Um, this is that second set of language. If the uh, policy board has a different opinion from what they did last August based on the MSC's um, concerns, then we can either rewrite the language, um, we can try to re tweak that language now, or we can come back to the group in February. Dave Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tony, in, in regards to uh, voting procedures, uh, is it the intent to identify the individual commi committee members who are in the majority and, and those that are in the minority? And, and, and if not, I, I think that would be useful for commissioners to know how individual technical people uh, had voted. Um, in other words, do exactly what you're proposing, just to identify the individuals that are in, in each group. It was not our intent to associate names with votes, only the number of votes um, to try to keep the voting a little bit anonymous so that that pressure that Cherie was talking about was, they didn't feel that peer pressure about the political versus the scientific and what would happen if it got out. It's not that the vote would be unanimous in the sense that, yes, the meetings are all open to the public and if you voted, you're raising your hand in one way or another and if someone is there, they can see, but that wouldn't be the record that was recorded unless that is the desire of the policy board and then we can write that into the, um, the guidance. I mean, the only reason I'm suggesting that is if, if I were reading minutes and I came across a minority opinion and I had some idea who the individuals were in the minority, then, and, and I needed a further explanation, then you have somebody to go to. You can actually contact, contact them, but, you know, maybe the confidentiality issue is more important than what I'm talking about. Doug? Well, a couple points, but to your point, David, um, in the past when we did minority reports, the, the, the person who uh, uh, wanted to craft that minority report clearly wanted people to know who, who they were. And now, from my personal standpoint, it's not important to me to know um, who voted for what, because I'm looking at the overall technical committee opinion. Uh, the reason that I, there's two reasons that I feel fairly strongly that there needs to at least be this out or option on a, on a vote was one because of what was mentioned before. We had an issue, a situation here where the technical committee could not come to a consensus. So essentially the management process stopped. This was in striped bass. We obviously weren't going to get a document out because they couldn't come to a consensus on something. Um, and to me, that's unacceptable. Um, the, the other reason that I, I am uh, concerned about just having a minority and majority report presented without any kind of numbers uh, votes on it is because if you do have that that scenario where I'm talking that I mentioned before where you have eight people in favor and one against that gives the one against equal weight with the eight other people on the technical committee that felt just as strongly in favor of the majority as opposed to if we had the vote, we'd know, yes, we understand that one person feels very strongly enough to create a minority report, but here is what the majority of the technical committee uh, 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 opinion was. Clearly, consensus should always be the number one uh, priority here, but sometimes that doesn't occur, and that's a, that's a good thing. Brandon? 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to, to Dave's point, I, I, I would not advocate for assigning names or state representatives to a particular vote. I, I don't support necessarily voting at the TC level, but if the policy board, which I must have slept through or must have been outvoted on at that particular time, I don't remember that discussion, but I, I came up through the TCs when we had consensus requirements. It was not a voting system, and, and to me it seemed to be okay. I guess my comment would be in terms of that might help a little bit, might be to define what consensus means. Does that mean it's 100% of the people need to approve, you know, agree on an issue, or is it a majority um, in terms of what consensus might be? I mean, I do agree that we need to, the TCs need to continue to provide advice to the board, even when they can't reach a consensus, that uh, their opinion has to, you know, still, you know, reach the board in terms of how they feel on things, but maybe, a, you know, adding what consensus means or a definition to that might help in terms of um, getting them to, to reach what consensus is. Thanks. Generally, consensus from our definition usually means that you can live with the result and it doesn't compromise your scientific integrity to have that recommendation go forward from the technical committee. Um, I grew, I came up through the voting technical committees and it wasn't political, it was just, you know, it was just the battles that, that would rage into the late night hours at BWI, you know, trying to get a, trying to get a position for the technical committee. And I, I mean, I just know, I know back in the old days of weak fish, if we'd had to operate by consensus, we'd still be working on weak fish. So, uh, I, I have real concerns, as does Doug, with not having a recommendation. Um, these folks work for us around this table. I mean, I'm assuming that you know the positions of your staff. Um, it would make me nervous to find out if I had one that was going off on a tangent or something or disrupting things. I, I would hope that staff would let us know if they were having difficulties with one of our technical representatives. So I, I don't particularly have a concern in regards to listing down the number. I think we used to do that though. I mean, it used to say, you know, everybody in favor, Lewis against. Um, most of the time. Um, <laughs> that's just eel. Um, one option to think about, and maybe this is splitting the difference a little bit, and it kind of gets to Doug's suggestion about, you know, having one person being able to generate a minority report, is that perhaps if they cannot come to a consensus, then their opinion has to be a supermajority of the technical committee. That way, there's got to be at least nine people that, or however many people are on the technical committee, and that would have you have at least three people in the minority um, that could then file a minority report. So as long as there's more than that negative supermajority, then you could have a minority report. The other option is to keep it the way we had it or to go back to just consensus. Those are the three options I can come up with. And there may be a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. Present. Um, Roy, sorry, Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As someone who first served on technical committees with this organization dating back to 1978, I think I've had a little experience in this regard. And like some of the others in the room, I've seen the procedures run the gamut. I think what I like, I heard what I, what I've heard today is I like that approach of a, um, uh, a majority report if they're unable to reach consensus and a minority report. Now, whether it's a nine vote um, minimum for that majority report or a super majority, I think you referred to it, versus a three person report, um, I'm not so sure I, I feel strongly one way or the other. But, but I like 
uh, I, I like the general suggestion of the report. I like the general direction that it's going with a, um, in the, in the event of a non-consensus, then, then I think it would be useful to have a majority report and a minority report. And I don't think it's necessary to identify individuals. I think if you're truly interested in, in checking with a person that uh, may have been instrumental in issuing a minority report, you can always check with the chairman of the technical committee rather than have that information be generally available to the public. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Doug? Just a question with the option that you were talking about that, you know, you'd need a, a super majority to, or you'd have to have at least a minimum number for a minority report. What would happen if, if you do have a, um, you know, uh, uh, very something, well, I guess the way I'd see it, okay. Uh, originally, I was thinking what would happen if you had something that was seven to six, but clearly you'd still have a majority and a minority report. But clearly, in your example, anything less than, than that two-thirds, uh, they'd still have to be voting on it. Uh, but anything less than that two-thirds, all you'd be presenting was the majority report. And so Correct. that way we'd be moving forward and we'd have an idea of, you know, it, uh, you know, I'm certainly comfortable with that. I still like the, the simple thing, but uh, what Tony's written here, because it still encourages this, this, this uh, uh, consensus as the primary uh, document, but I certainly could live with uh, your suggestion there. John? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just think that unless there's a logistical problem with producing a minority report, even if it's just one person, I don't see that being a problem. You know, if, if the one person wants to hold out and do this report, just to know what they're thinking, having worked with somebody for many years, recently retired, that would be that one person. Um, it's sometimes helpful just to know what their, what their problem is with the majority opinion. Thank you. Any other comments, thoughts, suggestions? Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm generally comfortable with the way this is going, but I, the only concern I have is if this were to start to develop into a regular pattern of every time it comes to our TC reports, we hear from the majority, and then, well, we hear the majority report, and then we hear the minority report. In other words, if it becomes a, a common occurrence, I, I, to me, it just doesn't feel right. I mean, I, I agree with the benefit of knowing what others on the committee think, and that would be reflected in a minority report, but given how challenged we are right now with our processes to now think that we're going to be hearing perhaps on a regular basis, and that's my point, how often might this happen? Both the majority and minority report, now the discussion goes into the back and forths of how the majority felt versus how the minority, I'm just wondering out loud how it might affect the logistics of our, of our process. So I'm trying to think this through, and I don't have a good suggestion other than I like the general direction this is going in, I like the idea of making sure we get a recommendation, which I think is what started all of this. And I like the idea of, of you know, working toward consensus and only as a last resort doing a vote. It's just that last part, that minority report that I'm, I'm struggling with. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Well, for my recollection, back in the day, we would often, some of us would actually get together and write a minority report unsolicited, you know, and then our state directors would carry those into the meeting or whatever. I think this actually gives everybody a little more of a heads up um, of what's coming, you know, f at, by actually having a minority and a majority report. Um, because if you've got some strong technical committee members and some very interested directors in specific issues, they're gonna, they're gonna take that information and run with it at the board level. Dave? Yeah, Tony mentioned, I thought it was, it was interesting and maybe informative that we implemented this in August and there's been at least a few different technical committees that have gotten together and you haven't even needed to go to the vote 
yet. So that's kind of encouraging in terms of frequency of uh, minority reports and so forth. Roughly how many TCs have, have met in the last few months? Three or four, or you think more than that? Where they actually had a decision on the table, maybe three, one more, you think? Maybe four? Well, I mean, I, so, I'm, so I'm sensitive to their request. Um, but it doesn't sound like there's a lot of interest in granting that request. Um, I think we can soften it some by keeping all the language that Tony has in the document. And then I'm going to throw out a recommendation here, just from what I've heard around the table, is maybe just simply require um, at least two preferably three dissenting voices to jumpstart a, a minority report, to require a minority report. I know somebody said one is cool. I think it was John. I'm sure if it's your guy, you'll want that minority report. But, or we can just keep it at, you know, the dissenting vote, whether it's, even if it's just one, gives a minority report. Right, yeah, absolutely. There would be no requirement for a, minor, for a minority report. But yeah, please. The language that we pulled together says the committee will also present the minority opinion, opinion prepared by that committee member or members that voted in the minority. So do you want me to change that language to say the committee may also present instead of will? Thoughts of May or Will? Does anyone, Dave? Yeah, I like the idea of May. You know, that then the burdens on the folks that dissented. Do they feel strongly enough to put that work in? And um, otherwise, it may be just an uncomfort level. But um, so I, I like that. Does anybody object to using May, Bob? Not objecting. I, I think the way Tony just read that, it said that the technical committee may present a minority report. I would think it would be the individuals in the minority have the opportunity to draft a minority report and bring that forward to the board. So, you know, so the minority report is not a product of the technical committee. It's the, a product of the individuals that are dissenting. Good, good suggestion. Yes, I like that. Is everybody comfortable? Pat? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Management and Science Committee also raised um, the other topic about having staff um, participate and then if it goes forward, vote on the technical committees. So I just want to provide some background on that, um, that it could be limited to the stock assessment staff um, with the explanation being for non-assessment technical committee work um, that that staff person is heavily involved in, if not leading the work, they would have the expertise um, and be informed to vote on that subject. Uh, whereas if they did not participate, you know, that would be one less informed person participating in the vote and the outcome of uh, advice brought to the board. Yeah, I don't. You may have been out of the room, but but um, I, I made the. I, I said I did not support that at all. I don't believe that the staff should be put in that position. I think they need to be unbiased facilitators and information sharers and gatherers. And to have them vote puts them in that political arena, potentially, that they would really worry me for them to get in. As everybody feels differently about that, you know, that's, that's my strong sense as the chair. Dave, if I could, I, I, I'm hearing a distinction maybe between a technical committee meeting and a plan coordinator who really is, need, I think, needs to serve a facilitator role, and maybe a stock assessment committee that's that's doing the the number crunching. And, I, and in that case, I certainly would want to hear from the folks we hired specifically to develop assessment advice. Well, I definitely want to hear from them, but do we want them voting? I think in that context, in a stock assessment committee, yes, I, I want, I would like their input in a, in a formal way, yeah. 
uh, you made a, a you used a term that that bothered me in the political arena. This is the scientific arena, and we're asking our technical committee and our stock assessment committees to give us the best unbiased technical advice. I, I would see uh, uh, that a stock assessment biologist, as in the past, we didn't have these ASMFC stock assessment biologists, but I could see where the stock assessment biologist that's helped um, develop this uh, stock assessment, as has the other state stock assessment biologists and federal stock assessment biologists, should, if uh, if they feel that this is um, something uh, something they like, I, I wouldn't have a, an objection to it. Objection to it. I agree totally that the plan development team quarter. There's no way uh, PDT coordinators should be voting. Uh, on a technical committee uh, uh, input. In fact, they shouldn't even, uh, the plan coordinator shouldn't be voting on the technical committee. Uh, but that's that's the way I understood it, and, and I like Dave in that very specific instance, someone providing their best technical unbiased advice. I, if they, if I would be not uncomfortable with allowing them to vote. As a distinction, I think where Pat was going is that uh, commission staff are members of stock assessment subcommittees. So Katie Drew is on the Stripe Bass um, Stock Assessment Subcommittee. Katie is not a member of the Stripe Bass Technical Committee, nor um, I or Mike wa is in a technical committee member. Um, and so that's where the two distinctions are, that there is times when commission staff do provide analysis or input for um, technical committee tasks. Um, and so the question is, would they be voting with the technical committee when they are working on those tasks? Because they are not committee members. And the guidance that we have here would say no, they would not be voting because they are not committee members. Only the committee members would be voting. So if you want something outside of this, then um, we would need to change the language. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I made comments like this back in August, but I think for the record, I want to go on and say it again. Um, my, I'm comfortable with where we're going. I do believe we will be revisiting this very soon. And uh, I just think it's important for us to recognize, um, I'd like to at least state my concerns about this, is that uh, as, um, as we get into more and more difficult discussions, where we are seeking um, more technical certainty. Uh, I'm afraid the direction we're going um, is that the discussions are going to be encapsulated in a vote with numbers. Well, this was eight to three or seven to three or whatever the number may be. And I just think it's a very, very important that um, when we leave this room here this week, we own a strike bass decision. We own an eel decision. Uh, we'll own other decisions later. Uh, and I think it's important that we keep in mind that uh, the strength of the commission is in our group um, and in the collective decision making um, that we've had for 73 years. Uh, I get concerned when we talk about, well, I just want to make sure that my voice is heard from, a, from technical advice um, and, and that that voice is going to be um, diluted, or excuse me, um, shorthanded with um, simply a vote coming out of a technical committee. So uh, nothing that, um, uh, I've got no alternative here, um, but I think it's important that we should recognize that. I think consensus still is a very, very powerful tool um, for a group as diverse as we are, um, with as interest as varied as ours. I think consensus is very, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly? Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> I was on vacation in Alaska in August, so I think I guess I got a legitimate excuse for why I don't remember <laughs> this conversation the last time. Um, I can certainly appreciate that the striped bass conversation is very fresh in all of our minds from a discussion this week, um, but 
from what I heard from Tony's response to Dave's question, it certainly sounds like that situation is relatively isolated and it's, it's seemingly not happening um, consistently. And so it just raises the question to me um, of, going, of going down this path, path um, and whether we really need to do that um, or if we're just having a specific reaction to a specific something that's happened most recently. Um, not suggesting stopping moving forward if that's what the board wants to do, but just something that sort of caught my eyes we're having this conversation. Kind of caught mine too. So I don't know, I mean, Spud? Yeah, just I guess a follow up to what Robert said is that what, what concerns me is that, you know, we, we are plagued by uncertainty. And if we end up giving our technical advisors a tool to vote, then what I'm afraid will happen is their votes will become the proxy measurement of uncertainty. So if you end up with a seven to four or a six to four or whatever, in our minds, it's, we're gonna have a hard time saying, well, that's, that's not the strength of the uncertainty that's being represented here. So that's, that's a slippery slope that I'm, I'm afraid we go down. Jim? Um, I'll add my voice to the choir, and, and I think we start going down there. <clears throat> We're going to get to what I think was out of control yesterday, was someone will ask for um, roll call votes on that, and the next thing you know, um, we're gonna have what we had yesterday. I'll just make that comment, I think that got a little out of control. I mean, we used to not have a lot of roll call votes, and now we're doing them like for everything. So it's, it's you know, I, I would feel more comfortable leaving it with the consensus, and I think Kelly's right. You know, we shouldn't, it's what we all do in government. It's like we get one little problem and the majority is not really, is working pretty well. And then we come up with a new procedure to fix that one little problem. I think I'd, I'd prefer to let it ride for the time being until we really do have a problem. Right now we've got our, our, recommend, our charge to the committee is to vote if they can't meet consensus and strongly urge consensus, but in the absence of consensus, they vote. So that's what we have, that's what we're, we directed them to do last August. So if we wanna change that, we need to change that. Um, I, think the, I think the issue of staff voting on stock assessment subcommittees is a lot bigger issue than one I wanna tackle today. Um, I'd really like to have the chance to talk, you know, internally, um, particularly with Bob and, and Doug about that issue because that raises some red flags that could take, I might miss my flight and I don't want to miss my flight. Um, so uh, if that's okay with y'all to handle it that way, um, I'd rather handle that issue that way. Um, but we need to resolve the direction to the technical committees on voting and whether or not we want to continue directing them to vote in the case of no consensus or not. Dave? I think, um, I think you know, we made a decision in August. We've had a little bit of experience with it. Um, Let's, let's give it to the February meeting. Well, there'll be more uh, TCs getting together, more experience with it. Um, I think a lot of the issue um, can be personality driven, and I, I, um, I think we might be in probably a better, calmer waters as far as that goes presently. Um, so while I'm a consensus person uh, like uh, Jim and, and Robert, we made a decision in August, let's give it a little more experience and, and encourage the plan coordinators to really work toward that consensus and, and use the, the vote as a last resort. Yeah, I, I, I would. that would be the direction I would like to see us go in. And, and, and also that gives us an opportunity to talk to our technical committee folks as well. I mean, again, they work for us, most of them. So I mean, having our opportunity to find out what the real angst is there. Um, I wish I'd have known about that discussion at the meeting. I would have liked to have attended to hear the discussions from the MSC. So is there anything else that we need to do on this issue at this time? Um, Leroy? 
just a thought. I mean, it seems to me that, yeah, you want to work towards consensus, but, you know, all the commissioners should know just how much uh, likelihood is of error or what the sensitivity is around these issues. And I would think that, you know, the, the uh, technical committee could work towards consensus, but also make sure to include in that report some of the concerns that are, you know, to make them clear so that the com commissioner is aware of that. Because ultimately, yesterday we didn't go with the uh, technical committee recommendation. But we, you know, we looked at all the the, sit, the uh, considerations and, and made a decision not to go with that. So I would want to know if there was significant concern on behalf of uh, of a technical committee member, at least to know what that is. And I could, I would think you could include that in in a consensus report, but just include that information in some way. Good suggestion. Anything else on this topic? So I think as Robert said, we'll be talking about this again, for sure. It's a sensitive issue, I recognize. Um, Doug, have you got an Atlantic herring? So oh, I do? Oh, sorry. Mike, how could I forget Mike? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will make this extremely brief. Um, I just wanted to update the board that everything is on schedule for results of the 2015 benchmark stock assessment for Atlantic Menhaden. We have um, a CDAR review in December. That'll be an independent peer review of that assessment. We have a TC meeting next week, actually, to make a final review of the assessment document and prepare that to be submitted to the peer review for December. Um, this stock assessment subcommittee has worked incredibly hard over the last two years to prepare this assessment and has really just completely reinvigorated the assessment model, looking through all um, existing and new data sets um, and really has done a nice job putting together um, the most comprehensive assessment they could for this very important speech of ours, so compliments to them. I've worked very closely with um, our stock assessment subcommittee and TC on this, so um, <clears throat> you can, yeah, I'm not even following the slides, but um, <clears throat> anyways, yeah, so the other part of the assessment is remember that we have these interim reference points for um, until we can develop the ecosystem-based reference points, and that's part of um, initial review of this assessment. So um, our biological ecological working group has put together some preliminary things on um, the development of those ecosystem-based reference points, and that will be part of the peer review process. So we should get some feedback, um, initial feedback on the development of those, and that will be that's a term of reference for our assessment. So um, we will also be presenting that in February. So um, with that, I'll, I'll end and take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mike. Questions for Mike on the progress of the Menhaden assessment? All right, no questions on Menhaden issue. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, I think the last item is the uh, hearing section. Yeah, I'm making this motion on behalf of the hearing session since the uh, chair is, is uh, not able to attend a policy board meeting. Um, I'll make the motion and then give you a very brief uh, um, uh, description of what led to this. On behalf of the herring section, move to recommend the commission send a letter to NOAA Fisheries recommending a modification in the herring closure notice to reflect ASMC no landing days and timing of the state notifications to directors. Um, Mr. Chairman, what happened last week was uh, there was a notice from uh, NOAA Fisheries that the um, uh, Herring 1A fishery had attained, was projected to attain 92% of 
um, of the of the uh, attack, and per uh, the ASMC management plan, this meant the fishery should close as well as the, the uh, uh, federal waters would close as of 12:01 uh, on the 26th. Um, the states of of uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire were able to, were able to close, but because of uh, a need on the part of Maine to have um, uh, a three-day period to try and get a formal notice in a newspaper, um, they were unable to close, and so herring vessels went out, uh, fished, and came to port on um, on uh, Saturday, and then waited to offload until uh, the landing period on, on Sunday, which was at six o'clock. Um, this was because of the way the notice was written um, by National Marine Fishery Service, that it didn't have any mention of the ASMC no landing days. And also in the past, the state directors have always been given uh, um, a heads up that this quota was gonna be attained so that we could get our notices in place, at the, you know, ready our notices to be triggered at the same time. This did not happen this year, probably because there was a changeover in, in the administration at GARFO. Um, and so they didn't realize the past practices. So these were two of the ways that, um, two of the three ways that we have agreed at the section in between the states of Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts to try and prevent this situation from going again. And we felt that we needed to send a letter because we are a section and there is no uh, National Marine Fisheries representation on the section. So just to complete the, the communication cycle, we'd like to have the uh, commission send this letter to, to Garfo and and uh, they already know know it's coming, so. Any questions for Doug? Is there any objection to this motion from the hearing section? Seeing none, motion carries. That brings us to the end of our agenda. Is there is any other business? Yes, Jim. Uh, Lewis, just very quickly, and I, I don't want any policy change on this, but just as I mentioned before, um, the, um, I'm glad we have uh, roll call votes. We're doing those. I agree with them for final actions, all those things, but quite frankly, I think every one yesterday was a little excessive and was kind of slowing us down, so I just would suggest to the commissioners that they use a little discretion on that because I think it's important for big issues, but when we're doing routine stuff, we do not need roll call votes, and it just slows the process process down. Thanks. You'll need to say that again when the primary person that was asking for roll call votes on everything is in the room. Well, actually, there's a couple of them, but that's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there was one in particular. We won't get into name calling. Here, it's just laid out. All right. Anything else to come before the policy board? Seeing none, we're adjourned and the business session is in session. Resolutions committee. Steve Train. <laughs> Thought. <laughs> He's not here, so it's Rick Bellavance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on behalf of the Resolutions Committee, which is Steve Train and Bernie Pankowski and myself, I'd first like to thank uh, Laura and Tina and the rest of the staff for helping us develop uh, a resolution for this event and also offer the following, a resolution in appreciation of Connecticut as our host state. Whereas the 73rd annual meeting of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission was held in the quaint seaport of Mystic, Connecticut, which provided a charming background for the commissioners, management and science, law enforcement, habitat, Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat partnership membership members, and the commission staff to tackle issues of mutual concern. And whereas <clears throat> the fall weather and brilliant foliage of the Connecticut coast were enjoyed by all, and whereas the opening reception at the Mystic Aquarium was an event difficult to repeat with heartfelt remarks by our esteemed chair, Dr. Daniel, with appetizers and camaraderie enjoined in the company of multicolored lobsters and beluga whales, and whereas the 23rd annual Laura Leach Fishing Tournament provided anglers with opportunities for both ocean and inland fishing with a covered
Bird Bridge, providing cover for Dr. Malcolm Rhodes' winning entry. And whereas dinner at Latitude 41 <clears throat> gave our friends to the South a northern delicacy that northerners often take for granted, which they refer to as big crayfish, and our Connecticut hosts kept our waistlines in mind by keeping the desserts to an absolute minimum. <laughs> 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 and whereas David Simpson continued his quest to counteract, or counteract the, va the volum, volum I knew I was going to mess this word up, large amounts <laughs> of Swedish fish consumed this week by providing healthy doses of Macintosh apples for our enjoyment. And whereas Craig Miner, sweet as he is, according to Laura and the ladies anyway, provided us with honey from his bees to sweeten the rest of us. And whereas the 24th annual David Hart Award recognized Pat Augustine for his unwavering commitment to successful management of marine fisheries along the Atlantic coast with his acceptance speech, not only providing much needed encouragement to his fisheries management colleagues, but also brought a tear to nearly everyone in attendance. And whereas Bernie Pankowski was thwarted, thwarted from even going out fishing for the first year, that he did not have to compete with the aforementioned Mr. Augustine, who still won upped him by winning the David Hart Award. <coughs> And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission expresses its deep appreciation to the State of Connecticut Commissioners David Simpson, Craig Miner, and Lance Stewart for their exceptional assistance in the planning and conduct of this outstanding 73rd annual meeting. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, could I, I want to thank the uh, uh, Resolutions Committee, too. I, I know we did that last year, and it's, and it's a bit of fun, and, and uh, you got some great um, great zingers in there, so I appreciate that. Uh, it's, it's been great hosting. It was a lot of, a lot of fun to do, actually, and, and the staff make it more fun. I've told Bob that and others individually. I mean, tremendous help, and it really did make it fun, and it was a great opportunity for us to for me to get my staff here um, and see the commission, which uh, not all of them get, get to do, and certainly my higher ups in Hartford, it was a great opportunity and and uh, uh, something of an eye opening experience to, for for some of them, uh, especially my deputy commissioner and, and our uh, um, uh, legislative liaison to experience uh, the striped bass discussion. Uh, uh, they understand a little more now what I what I do when I disappear, as we all do four times a year, and, and uh, struggle with these things. So, uh, thanks everyone, and and I hope you did have a, a, an enjoyable time here, and we'll get back together in February. I guess with that, the 73rd annual meeting of the ASMFC is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>